is Ruby Barr with Southside Community Law Center. We're here in Tallahassee, Florida, and I want to discuss or provide assistance with how to fill out the financial affidavit. Now, if you're doing a packet, you've either gotten it from the clerk of court in your county, or you go to floridacourts.org and downloaded the copy, and you can type right on it. Now, with the financial affidavit, there are two versions. There's the one that where your income is more than $50,000, and then there's the one where your income is less than $50,000, okay? That's called the short form. But nevertheless, the, it, the information is still pretty much basically the same. It, it's your information, and you should know that. Um, again, when you're filling out these forms, you should know what judicial circuit that you're in. If you don't know, you should definitely know what county you're in. And so you put in the county, if there's a case number already assigned to the case, add that case number in. If it's a very brand new case and you're filing for the first time, there will be no case number, so leave that blank. If you're the petitioner, which means you're the one that's filing this case, then you need to add in the line above petitioner your name and whoever the respondent is, which is the other parent. Now, there are two times when people will have to file a financial affidavit. Uh, if you're filing a case, if you're filing a case, as the petitioner for the very first time, then your financial affidavit is required. In the state of Florida, in child support cases um, or parenting, family cases, both parties, when children under 18 are involved and when there are assets between the parties through a divorce, both parties must file financial affidavits. So it's mandatory. So again, in filling out this form, it says, I, for a legal name. Okay, that's you. What's your name? Because this is your form, and this is about your income and your expenses, all right? So now they ask you your occupation and who you're employed by, okay? So you may be a school teacher. You may be employed by the private school or the public school system. And then what's their business address? You add that in. Sometimes addresses are in other states and whatnot. So you just add it in. Now your pay rate. Are you paid every week, every other week? twice a month or once a month or, or something else. I mean, some people on a daily rate, but whatever it is, just check the box, okay? Now, it says check here if unemployed and explain on a separate sheet your efforts to find employment. Most people don't do it, but you can do it. All right, now, section one, present monthly gross income. It's really important. Your gross, okay, that's before they take out anything, not your net, this is your gross. Now, you have to provide a monthly total. So it means that if you don't know your monthly and you're paid weekly, there's a formula. Get the gross, multiply it times 4.3. Now, well, you know what? How about their instructions with all of these forms? It's tedious. It's a lot. That's why I'm trying to simplify it for you. Okay, if it's Oh, and there's another way to do it too. If it's weekly, this is the one I like the best. If you get paid every week, get your gross multiplied by 52, for the 52 weeks in a year, and divide by 12. That'll also give you a monthly. Now, some of you all, y'all income is just all over the place. I mean, there's, there's overtime, there's lack of time. I mean, just all kinds of things. So sometimes you may have to just get your tax return for that year, you know, depending on where we are in a year, um, if it's if it's the same income. If you pretty much do a standard 40 hours a year, then that's good. Then just divide that by 12 if you have your tax return. Um, if you pay bi-weekly, you multiply that by 26, 26, and divide it by 12, okay? If you pay monthly, Wow, that makes it easy. So that's what goes in there, your monthly gross salary or wages. Um, sometimes people don't have a salary. They get Social Security disability or they get supplemental income, which is SSI. SSI is public assistance. I need to make sure that people understand that. SSI is public assistance, which is why the maximum amount that you can get on that check is about $780. And you pretty much automatically qualify, in most instances, for food stamps. Um, so, or you may be on workers' comp, or you may be on unemployment, whatever it is that you're receiving, you may be getting alimony, you may be getting some proceeds from a trust, whatever it is, you know, um, just fill in the blank. Now, if you work for yourself, that's uh, that income has to go in here as well. 
Now I want to talk about deductions. Some people have a lot of deductions and they have spaces for you to put all those deductions. You know, your federal deductions, um, your Medicare deductions, your FICA, mandatory union dues, mandatory retirement. Um, if you're paying for health insurance for you and a child, and if you're paying child support for another child that's not in this case. That's important because sometimes people own child support for this child and they put it there. No, you can't do that. If it's another child that's not in this case, put it there. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The next section is what really gets people. This gets them so upset. But before we go there, you total your deductions. And once you total your deductions, then you have to subtract it from your gross and that's your present net monthly income. Only for purposes of this form now, not for purposes of the child support guidelines. Please remember that. But just for purposes of this form. But the part that really gets a lot of people upset is that by the time they get through writing out their average monthly expenses, everybody's in the hole. And we know that's just real life. That, that's real life. Most people are in the hole. Uh, we'd be like, well, how are we making it? A child, the grace of God. The grace of God. That's all I can say. But when you write all those expenses down, then you have to total them. And then you have to, again, take your net monthly income and your total monthly expenses, and you're going to see what's the difference. Either there's a surplus that a lot of people just do not have, and then some may have a $2 surplus. Most folks, there's going to be a deficit. Now, let me make this very clear. Your expenses, listen to me clearly, your expenses are not figured into the guidelines. Don't nobody care how much you pay for rent, your car note, your haircuts, the dry cleaners, even what you give to the church or any other charity. It's irrelevant when it comes to computing the child support guidelines. And you may only bring home a few dollars because you got all kind of deductions and auto pays coming out of your check. There are only certain deductions that are allowable. So you know you got Aflax coming out and you paying life insurance. Sorry, all that gets put right back into your income. And so people get real upset and I understand that. And so maybe some of you all might wanna go and tell some of these people, say, look, yo, let me tell you, you may not wanna go out there having all these kids, honey, cause they gonna take your money whether you like it or not, and you're not going to be able to drive that nice car that you want. So if you want to drive a nice car and you want to travel and whatnot, then don't have all these kids. Now, if you're married, that's different. Don't have all these kids. And then, of course, now, if you married, stay married. Because, honey, two could, hold, two could live a whole lot better than one. Because you sit there and you leave that person, you're thinking that, mm, I just can't do them no more. And you go to somebody else, when child, the divorce rate is even higher in second marriages. Work it out. Figure it out. Work it out. Do what's necessary. Get on one accord. All right. So, going on with the assets. Yeah, there's a section about the assets. Cash you got in the bank or in the credit union. Cash you got up under your mattress. That's what it means when it says on hand. In your wallet, under your mattress, you know, Put away someplace, you know, dug in the background, whatever that is. Well, you probably cannot put that part in there. You can just leave that secret, okay? But what's in your wallet, you know, which probably about 5 or $10 because most people don't carry cash anymore. Uh, stocks and bonds, real estate, the value of your home. Now, this part right here um, is not as, is not really applicable when it comes to paternity. But this part is crucial when you're in a divorce because assets, once you're married, there's marital property. Your retirement, part of that, if not all of that, is considered marital property. So all that has to be divvied up at the end, okay? So what you think is yours, you know people say that one, well, hmm, mm, honey, what's, what's mine is mine, what's his is mine. No, uh-uh. What's yours and his is y'all's own. That's how it go. All right. So again, because by the time that judge and some judges do it real differently, some of them split it right down the line it's called equitable uh, distribution to some, some judges that mean equal. 
So if y'all got a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, fifty thousand going to you, fifty thousand going to him. Or if you got more to asset value than the other person, you're gonna write them a check. It's it's interesting. That's why you better be careful before you just up marrying people unless you know you want to be with them for the rest of your life, you know? And and who is it that said marriage is not to be entered into unadvisedly, you know, and not to be taken lightly. Because, honey, back in the day when I was young, the man wrote a song, says it's cheaper to keep her. In some instances, it is. Now, we talk about enormous circumstances. People I'm not talking about when somebody has some sort of serious mental condition or some serious drug addiction or something like that. We're just talking about in normal circumstances where I just don't want to be married anymore. Well, you may have to pay. It just all depends. So that's the assets that just remember, if you marry, that's marital property. So just in case uh, people thinking that they're going to get over, they could just go charge for all this debt. Mm -mm. Debt can be marital property. And if you just go out there and you just charge him willy-nilly, you might get stuck with that. If you think, you, I'm going to stick it to him or I'm going to stick it to her, ah, that might backfire you. So you might want to think about that before you do that. And so they're going to look at your mortgages. They're going to look at car notes and credit cards. And when you are married, there is this form, and we're not going into it. I'm just going to reference it. It's called mandatory disclosure you are going to have to provide the proof of the information to everything that you owe and own, everything. And so people try to sit and they try to hide and whatnot. And, and I understand that, but honey, listen, a lot of lawyers, oh, we know how to find it. We know exactly how to find it. So you might as well just go on and provide it. Or better yet, I got a better suggestion. How about do what you need to do to stay married and not have to come see a lawyer at all? I'm just saying. All right, so after we've done our assets and we've done our liabilities, you don't really have to worry about a child support guideline sheet. Um, you really don't. Sign it, notarize it, and send it to the court. So that's pretty much what's required. Just a, a brief recap for the financial affidavit is that there are two financial affidavits. There's one that if you make more than $50,000, and there's another if you make less than $50,000. And so now financial affidavits take on different perspectives if the parties are married or if the parties are not married. If the parties are married, those assets and liabilities are crucial because that has to be divided between the parties and whatnot. Uh, when it comes to parties that have never been married, um, the income is most crucial. And it's important to realize that all deductions from your paycheck are not allowable deductions in determining what your net income is because there are certain things that mm, they are gonna be put back into your income. And the other thing is, is that if you have no income, the state will impute income to you. Minimum wage will be imputed to you at 40 hours a week. So you might be working minimum wage, but you're only working 20 hours a week. They're going to impute 40 hours. And so that's important to, to know. You will pay child support. And one thing about child support is, is that, um, particularly the Department of Revenue gets involved. If Department of Revenue gets involved, they're going to take that money out of your check. There's going to be an income deduction order. Um, it's now known as a withholding order. They're also, um, they can intercept your tax returns. They can intercept your stimulus checks. They can take part of your workers' comp, your Social Security. If you win the lottery, they could take a portion of that. You get an accident settlement, um, they can take a portion of that. That had, I mean, That's a law. Some of you already know that driver's licenses can be suspended and whatnot, you know. Um, but the other thing is, is that you can be arrested and, and they can do what's called a writ of attachment. You in jail for a couple of days. Who wants to do that? And the only way you get out is you have to make a payment, some sort of uh, cash payment. And so again, um, let's just do our best to do right by our children. So again, this is Ruby Barr with Southside Community Law Center, letting you know that knowledge is power, information is king.